this video, we're going to be talking about death and dying. Pharmacists can work in a variety of settings caring for many different populations of people. Some of these settings provide inpatient care to patients, such as hospitals or nursing homes, while others focus on outpatient type care, such as home health care. We care for both healthy and unhealthy newborns, children, adults, and older adults, and provide interventions that are aimed at maintaining wellness and restoring health. The human body is remarkable and can heal from many serious conditions, including severe trauma, infectious diseases, and many other alterations in health. Sometimes, however, people develop conditions that cannot be cured despite the many modern advances in medicine. The end result of medicine that cannot reverse the process of illness eventually will be death. Sometimes death is unexpected, as from an accident, while other times it can be anticipated, as when chemotherapy is no longer effective for a person diagnosed with an advanced form of cancer. Pharmacists working in healthcare settings not only provide care to pe people who are restoring their health, but also to those who are dying. It is essential that healthcare professionals have the knowledge and skills to care for patients who are dying and their families who are dealing with the impending loss. Being a healthcare professional does not exclude us from having difficult or uncomfortable conversations with people. These will occur and it is important to be prepared for it. What would you do or say when you walk into a room to give your patient their scheduled medication and they say to you, so did you hear? I only have two weeks left. Or I'm done with that awful chemo. I want to go home and die. Your natural inclination might be to ignore what you heard, administer the medication, and quickly leave the room. We do not avoid these conversations because we are not knowledgeable or because we don't care. In fact, we care very much and do not know how to respond in a way that we perceive as helpful to the patient. We do not want to say the wrong thing. At the end of life, however, saying nothing is the wrong thing. It is never wrong to simply say, I'm sorry, I wish this wasn't happening to you, or to quietly sit with someone and hold their hand. Your presence, if you are truly present, will be comfort enough. Theories can be useful tools for pharmacists and clinicians because they can provide useful information about the patients we care for. People who live with serious illnesses have common factors that can affect their lives and the way they live with their illness. There have been several theories developed that have aimed to describe the ways people react to their illness and cope with the knowledge of their impending death. Pharmacists and clinicians should become familiar with these theories in order to better understand how their patients are dealing with these issues. Although each patient is an individual and may not behave entirely like what is described in a theory, it is useful for the pharmacist to be aware of how the majority of people deal with these issues. This will enable the pharmacist to better anticipate the needs and concerns of patients who are going through similar life events. So as we discussed in a previous video about health-related quality of life, this is a multidimensional concept that includes the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual functioning of a person. People who live with serious illness often have various stressors that can affect one or several of these dimensions. Understanding a person's quality of life can help pharmacists and clinicians plan appropriate care to meet the specific needs of that individual. Quality of life can differ from person to person, so perhaps an illness that affects one person's psychological dimension may not affect another person with the same type of illness in the same way. Only individual patients can determine which aspects of their quality of life are effective. As pharmacists, we often witness things that we might perceive to be stressors or problems that need to be solved. We should never assume or be the judge of another person's quality of life. What is important to one person or to the pharmacist may not be important to another. Even though the pharmacist may feel that their patient's social quality of life is negatively affected, they need to ask the patient and not just assume. The uncertainty that accompanies the chronic illness can be identified as living with continual uncertainty and appraised as either danger or opportunity. In people living with chronic illness, for example, exacerbations are often perceived as danger. For instance, patients with congestive heart failure may have thoughts about death only when the exacerbations occur. After recovery, these patients may return to another period of stability, during which time the immediate danger that was once perceived is now gone. People with chronic illnesses often wonder about what the future with their illness will be like. For instance, patients with severe pulmonary disease have reported their need to receive better information about what to expect with illness progression and about what dying might be like. They are aware of the 
progressive nature of their illness. However, they have great uncertainty about what to expect with their future functional status and how they might actually die. In contrast to our previous example in which heart failure patients only think about death during exacerbations, patients with chronic pulmonary disease are often thinking about the next exacerbation and if it will be their last. The concept of fear has been reported in many studies that explored the perspectives of people living with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The uncertainty in prognosis and illness progression seems to go beyond just a life expectancy estimate for many people who live with serious chronic illnesses. In 1969, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a book entitled On Death and Dying, in which she outlined a conceptual framework for how individuals cope with the knowledge that they are dying. She proposed five stages of this process that included denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Not all people will go through each stage and sequence, and some may skip stages altogether. It is important for pharmacists who care for patients who are dying to have an understanding about these stages in order to be able to properly care for and support themselves and their families. Denial is the first stage because many individuals will initially react to being told that they may die by denying what they heard. People in the first stage will be in disbelief and think that their doctor has made some kind of mistake. Often patients will go to another doctor for a second opinion during this stage. Denial can be important for two reasons. It will initially be somewhat of a shock absorber enabling the person to seek clarification about the truth and what they were told. It can also provide patients with the needed time to become acquainted with the possibility that the information they heard is true, which can enable them to internalize and begin the process and begin to process that information. Anger is the second stage and can be the most difficult for clinicians and caregivers to witness. In this stage, individuals have accepted that the news of impending death is true and they are naturally angry about it. They do not understand why they have to die and they make this known to those around them. They may lash out at clinicians and loved ones alike because they are angry about their situation. Often, no often nothing that clinicians or family members do for them is right and they have negative things to say about other aspects of their life as well. Patients in this stage realize that they have lots of things in their life that they wanted to accomplish, but now they will not have the time. The third stage is called bargaining, and it is a stage where that is rarely visible to onlookers as it happens internally within the person who is dying. In this stage, individuals realize that they are past denying that they are dying and that they have been angry about it, with neither of the two causing any change in the outcome. Patients at this stage may bargain with a higher power to change their outcome and give them more time. Sometimes patients might bargain with their doctor to try to find another option that might give them more time. But this bargaining is often accomplished internally between the dying patient and their higher power or God. Depression is the fourth stage and is a natural part of learning that impending death is near. Patients might be saddened because they had things they wanted to accomplish, places they wanted to go, or people they wanted to see, and those things will now be cut short. In addition, patients may be experiencing decline in physical abilities, loss of function, and increased symptoms such as pain. Those are factors that can lead to depression even in people who are not dying and are even more magnified in those who are. The final stage is acceptance. This stage does not mean that the person is happy about their impending death, but rather that they have come to accept it and have found a sense of peace with it. The first four stages involve mostly negative emotions which have taken a toll on the patient. Time has progressed and patients can begin to move past the negative emotions and focus on the time they have left. During this stage, their hope for a cure is replaced by a hope that their final days will be peaceful and their death will be what they want it to be. Now there are some criticisms criticisms of the Kubler-Ross model of dying. For instance, the theory does not apply to people who are not sure that they are going to die when the prognosis is ambiguous. The stages are not universal, nor do people go through them in progression. Anxiety, especially about pain, is omitted in her stages, and this is an important concern, especially for cancer patients. There are still a lot of differences in people's reactions to death related to family, culture, finances, personality, and etc. There are some important actions that pharmacists and clinicians can do during each of these stages to support the patient and their family. This table outlines each stage and the associated actions that pharmacists can do to help. Feel free to pause the video at this time to read over these.
Death awareness refers to the context surrounding patients' awareness of dying in the hospital setting. In general, there are four contexts of awareness of dying. Closed awareness, suspicion awareness, mutual pretense awareness, and open awareness. Closed awareness occurs when clinicians fail to disclose prognostic information to the patient. The patient is kept in the dark about their poor prognosis and impending death. Healthcare clinicians are careful not to say anything to the patient that would make him or her aware that their death was near. Patients often begin to suspect that they are not being told everything, particularly if a pharmacist, a nurse, a doctor appear secretive in their conversations. This may lead to the patient to move to the next context of awareness, which is suspicion awareness. And this is when the patient has suspicions about his, over, his or her overall prognosis and health status in this context begins to realize that he or she is not being told this important information. This might lead the patient trying to find out the truth by asking various staff members direct or indirect questions that could provide information about their suspicions. Often patients will try to trick the staff member into telling them something. For example, a patient may tell a pharmacist that the doctor said that their illness is very serious in efforts to either prove or disprove their suspicions. Mutual pretense awareness refers to both to when both the patient and clinician are aware that the other party knows of the poor prognosis or impending death. Instead of acknowledging it openly, both parties pretend that it is not true and continue to act as though everything was normal. This arrangement acts as a coping mechanism for the patient who might not be ready to openly discuss the poor prognosis. This also can be a feature of a clinician's death anxiety or difficulty with trying to address death with the patient. In open awareness, both the patient and healthcare clinician are aware of the poor prognosis or impending death and openly acknowledge it. This context allows both parties to openly talk about the prognosis, which could be beneficial to the patient in coping and acceptance of this situation. This context is also better for the staff member as they do not have to be careful not to get caught speaking about prognosis as in closed awareness, nor do they have to lie to the patient if they ask outright about their condition. The readiness to die theory was based on four patterns or modes that individuals could be going through at any given time that relate to the degree of readiness of their body and their self to death. Dying persons could only be in one mode at a time but could change between modes as their illness progressed and as they came to terms with their mortality. These four modes are organized by person ready, body not ready, person not ready, but body ready, or I'm sorry, person ready and body ready person not ready and body ready, or person not ready, body not ready. It is quite possible that death could occur within each of the four defined modes. However, as clinicians, we could only hope that the majority of our patients would be within the person ready, body ready mode. In this mode, both the patient's body and the patient's internal self are aligned as being ready. This theory provides a different way to think about how patients who know they are going to die might be processing that information. Grief is a process that can begin long before the loss of a loved one. The patient and family can have feelings of loss even as they anticipate an impending loss. Grief is the emotional response to that loss. Similar to the stages of dying, individuals go through the process to help them eventually cope and be able to live with that loss. This process has been referred to as grief work, and as with the stages of dying, people can go through stages in varying order. People never get over their loss, but find ways to live with the loss and without their deceased loved one. The three-stage model of grief was developed in 2010 and includes the following components, notification and shock, experiencing the loss, and reintegration. The first stage, notification and shock, is when the individual first learns or acknowledges the loss. They often feel shock and numbness and may isolate them from others during this initial phase. In the second stage, the individual really experiences the loss both emotionally and cognitively. A host of feelings can occur during this stage, including anger, sadness, emptiness, as well as physical manifestations like insomnia or loss of appetite. The final stage is when the individual reorganizes and reintegrates into their life without the person they have lost. This last stage characterizes the healing that should ideally take place at the end of grief. There are several different types of grief reactions that people can have. Some of these are considered to be normal, while others signify an alteration in coping with the loss. Normal or uncomplicated grief symbolizes the most desirable and universal reaction to loss and is considered to be normal. 
The individual will have physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral reactions following the loss and will eventually move toward adjusting to it. The period of time for this can vary from person to person and is dependent on the type of relationship, type of loss, and individual factors related to the bereaved. The pharmacist should support the family to take their time that they need for this normal grief process to happen. Anticipatory grief is grief that occurs before the loss of a loved one. Sometimes anticipatory grief starts at the time of a terminal diagnosis and can proceed until the person dies. Both patients and family members can feel anticipatory loss. For the patient, they can anticipate the loss of independence, function, or comfort. This can cause a lot of pain and anxiety if not given the proper support. For the family, they often start grieving for the loss of their loved one before they die. Perhaps it is because they bear witness to the pain or suffering they see their loved one go through, or maybe they are also envisioning their own life without their loved one in it. They start to think about all the things that they still wanted to share with their loved one, who will likely not live long enough to do so. This type of grief has been shown to help cushion a person's bereavement reaction. Complicated grief may require professional assistance depending on its severity and can be further classified into four different types. Individuals could be at risk for complicated grief if they are experienced losses that are sudden or traumatic or resulting from suicide or homicide. If the person has already had a recent loss or previous losses from which they did not resolve their grief, it can be contributed to developing a complicated grief reaction with the new loss. Lack of support network or concurrent stressors such as ailing health or relationships can also contribute to this type of grief. Disenfranchised grief is defined as grief that has not been validated or recognized. This type of grief often develops in individuals who have lost loved ones to stigmatized illnesses such as AIDS or through socially unacceptable ways such as an abortion. The loss of a previously severed relationship, such as with divorce, can also contribute to this type of grief because the individual may not be able to mourn as openly for that loved one due to the circumstances surrounding their relationship. Then finally, unresolved grief. The bereaved has failed to move through the stages of grief and accomplished the work needed to come to terms with the loss. Many factors can contribute to the manifestation of this type of grieving and can include lack of formal closure, for instance, the loved one's body never found or laid to rest, multiple or concurrent losses, or social isolation. As mentioned before, grief can consist of physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral reactions to the loss. The bereaved person can feel the pain from their loss in any or all of these ways. Under each of these are some examples of the specific types of reactions. Grief and bereavement are universal experiences that people go through when they are dealing with a loss in their lives. Individuals each express and cope with losses differently. Bereavement includes grief and mourning and has been considered to be the time period in which the survivor adjusts to their life without their loved one. This period can include the time right after the loss or death occurs, during the funeral proceedings, and during the grieving process afterward. Different individuals respond to this period in various ways a person's age, physical and emotional health, culture, and previous experience with loss can all affect the way that they grieve during this period of time. Bereavement differs from grief in that it includes the period of time from the beginning of the loss until the acceptance has been reached. Mourning takes place during this time and can differ based on personal and cultural factors. The phrase letting go is a concept that has been explored in the context of death and dying. Family members who provide care to a terminally ill loved one often experience the phenomenon of letting go. This involves a process in which the end result is recognition of their loved one's impending death with some freedom from the immense emotional constraint usually experienced prior to this awareness. This can be done both before the death and after and is part of grief and bereavement. The concept of letting go is comprised of four distinct, at, distinct attributes. These include a shift in thinking or a crucial turning point, recognition of the fact that despite efforts to save the loved one, they are dying or have died, and all hope for recovery or prolonged life is exhausted. Three, acknowledging the impending physical and emotional loss that will occur with the death and four, allowing the progression to inevitable death to occur by choosing not to prolong or impede this natural progression. Some of these attributes are similar and might be compared with anticipatory grief, anticipatory mourning, and death awareness. 
While this video has mainly focused on the family who is grieving the loss of a loved one, it is also important to recognize the health of the pharmacist who cares for the patients at the end of life. Much of what has been talked about in this video focuses on the importance of establishing an effective pharmacist-patient family relationship which will foster effective communication. In end-of-life care, with each connection you make to a patient in your care will come a subsequent loss as patients die. Over time, multiple losses that are not well supported could take their toll on you. Pharmacists witness, witness much pain, suffering, and distress in patients and families alike. They also can experience distress related to ethical or moral issues that are encountered as a result of various health care decisions that occur at the end of life. Factors that can affect the way a pharmacist who cares for dying patients adapt to the losses experienced in the workplace include pharmacist's educational level, personal death history, life changes, and support systems. Pharmacists who work with this population have to find a way to balance the losses they experience through healthy expressions of their feelings. Informal support systems such as talking with coworkers or peers can also help provide a supportive environment for the pharmacist. Engaging in self-care activities such as massage or vacation can also help the pharmacist cope with the effects of their role. And even if you do not practice in a clinical setting and you decide that you want to do community pharmacy, you will develop relationships with the patients that regularly come into your pharmacy. And even their deaths, expected or not, can take a toll on you because you have developed some sort of relationship. And this topic of death and dying and how it affects the medical professional is something that has largely been ignored in um, professional training and schooling, but it is a very important piece of your experience as a healthcare provider. If you have any questions or would like to talk about this further, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.